Hello, it's Wednesday the 3rd of May 2017, 1 o'clock Eastern Time, and this is Student Affairs Live, the online learning community for Student Affairs educators. I am your host, Heather Shea from Michigan State University, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. On today's live broadcast, I'm talking with five editors of the New Directions for Student Leadership series. Before I introduce my guests, I'm going to give a quick shout out to the folks who make these free webcasts possible. Student Affairs Live is a part of the Higher Ed Live Network. Our episodes offer you direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. Be a part of our live broadcast by sharing your knowledge, and you can participate in today's discussion by tweeting us using the hashtag Higher Ed Live. Thank you to my friend, colleague, and soon-to-be new graduate of the Michigan State University Student Affairs Administration Program, Alex Sylvester, who is moderating today's back channel. Today's episode is made possible by ACPA, College Student Educators International. Support for Student Affairs Live is one of the many ways AC, ACPA provides innovative professional development. Visit myacpa.org to discover other personal and professional development opportunities. Higher Live is also produced by M. Stoner, a digital first agency committed to tailored solutions that drive real results. Trusted by thousands of higher ed professionals, M. Stoner webinars are jam-packed with timely, strategic, and actionable knowledge. Check out their library of on-demand content from digital storytelling to myth-busting websites. We are tweeting another link now. Okay, so on with the show. I am thrilled today to welcome back five individuals to Student Affairs Live. We've gathered to talk today about their work with the New Directions for Student Leadership series. Before I introduce my five panelists, let me tell you a little bit about New Directions. Um, many of you may be familiar with New Directions, the, the broader series, but this particular series, New Directions for Student Leadership, was established in 2015. Um, you may be familiar with New Directions for Student Services, New Directions for Higher Education, or one of the other series. And as, as a very unique publication type, Josie Bass describes New Directions as quarterly journals featuring in-depth coverage of specialized topics and contributions from some of the top minds in the field. Which I completely agree. Um, so the NDSL, New Directions for Student Leadership series, focuses on the conceptual and pedagogical leadership topics of interest to high school and college leadership educators. The series editors, Dr. Susan Comavez and Dr. Kathy Guthrie, um, are here today uh, welcome to Student Affairs Live, Kathy and Susan. Thank you. We are also joined by three issue editors. Uh, Dr. Corey C. Miller is editing the forthcoming volume called A Competency-Based Approach to Student Leadership Development. Welcome, Corey. Dr. Dan Tillipa is here representing the forthcoming issue he co-edited with Paige Haber-Curran, Critical Perspectives on Gender in Student Leadership. Welcome, Dan. And Dr. Josie Alquist is here to discuss the issue she and Lisa Enders B wrote called Going Digital in Student Leadership. So now we're gonna get on with the broader episode. Welcome to all of you, welcome Josie. So I'd like to start as you introduce yourself, um, besides working on the New Directions for Student Leadership series, what else do you do? And then presumably each of you have had some type of student leadership experience. So I'd love to hear a little bit about what that experience might be um, and just share with us a leadership role that you've served in in a certain period in your life. Um, so Susan, we're going to start with you today. Okay. Thank you, Heather, for doing this. It's wonderful. Um, I, am, I have the wonderful title of Professor Emerita from the University of Maryland, so I do retirement. And this is wonderful. All of you should keep seeking to, to reach this stage. It's truly great, particularly when you get to do great projects like this. But I love the question that you asked, and, and I have to go back to high school. I think that's when, in our leadership identity development research, too, that's when most people become aware of leadership and leader things happening around them. But I was Miss Student Council. I was everything in Student Council at Vero Beach High School and um, liked figuring out how things ran and how they could be better and who you could influence and what we could do as students to influence that, change that. I uh, ran for student government president in high school and lost by eight votes, but who remembers, you know, the details. <laughs> Uh, high school quarterback, but so um, uh, high school goes back to student council for me. That is great. I love this. I was the editor of our high school yearbook, so it, it's similar high school experiences for sure. Kathy, tell us a little bit about you and your experiences. Yes, um, Kathy Guthrie. I am at Florida State University and I'm an associate professor there in the higher education program. 
and I also coordinate the undergraduate certificate in leadership studies. I would say, you know, I have high school experiences and I was student counsel as well, Susan, I didn't know that about you. Um, but mine actually, when I really think about it, it goes back to 4-H. I was a farm girl, grew up on a farm in central Illinois. And starting from when I was, you know, eight, I was really involved with 4-H and really was involved throughout college in, you know, a statewide and national level. And so just the lessons I learned through extension offices and 4-H really made me think about leadership as a process that we engage in. And so I could talk about positions, but also just how you can engage with others. Cool. Great. Thanks so much, Kathy. Corey, welcome. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Corey C. Miller, and I work at Wright State University as an assistant professor, and I teach undergraduate courses in organizational leadership. Um, so it's funny that you asked this question because I immediately went to thinking about roles too and to kind of piggyback off of what Kathy was saying. Mine was a moment. Um, I was really involved in college uh, in, in the Greek community. As a matter of fact, I was Panhellenic president at a very large institution. So it was sort of almost like holding a full-time job. And it was my senior year and I was also the intramurals chair of my sorority which I took very, very seriously because we wanted to win what we called the banner, which was the most intramural points that you could get out of any sororities. And it was the Greek award ceremony and I was winning Greek Woman of the Year. And it was the night we had a softball game. And I didn't go to the award ceremony. I went to the softball game to lead my team. And I remember everyone saying, what were you thinking? You, you should go get this award. This is reflective of all these leadership positions that you've done. And I said, I would never be getting that award if I didn't come to things like this softball game. And for me, that's when I realized what, what leadership was all about. It was about executing something bigger than just a role or a position. Corey, knowing you, that does not surprise does not surprise me at all. So I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Dan, tell us a little bit about your background in leadership. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Dan Tolopaw, uh, he, him, his, and uh, I currently work at uh, California Lutheran University in Thousand Oaks, California, where I am a faculty member in our counselor education department. Um, for me, I, there were actually a couple moments of, of leadership that sort of speak to me. Uh, Kathy mentioned mine as well. I was a 4-H'er growing up. Um, I grew up on a family farm uh, in upstate New York and was definitely involved as a teenager in a bunch of 4-H activities, um, particularly our teen leadership council within our county. And that was really fundamentally sort of the first time that I was sort of thinking about leadership in a much more sort of sophisticated way than like positional sort of approaches um, but I think the big piece for me when I think about like where I learned the most about relational leadership and leadership being a process was as a resident assistant um, at my undergraduate at, at Ithaca College in upstate New York and so I just think the mentors that I had um, helped shape me to be who I am and be a part of this field and to even know that this career of working in student affairs and higher education was possible. And so I, I feel like the generativity piece of the LID model for me um, and leadership identity development is alive because of those experiences that I had as an RA on campus. So great to be here today with everybody. Great. Thanks so much, Dan. Josie, welcome. Thank you. So I'm Josie Alquist. I'm based in Los Angeles, but I teach online and work with Florida State University uh, as a research associate and leadership instructor. And then the rest of my time is spent who knows where I am each week. This week I'm in, um, I'm in New York um, in a colleague's office because I go out and I do uh, speaking to especially students, student leaders, faculty and staff about the research that I do and just trying to help students move closer to what leadership could look like online. And I had to just kind of light up and crack up because I mean, I adore all of you. And for 4-H to come up so much, I grew up in Wyoming, so I was forced into 4-H. I wanted to be a brownie. Mom didn't want that for me. Um, but I learned public speaking. I learned about how to appreciate your community and give to your community. So even, and, and then again, Susan sharing about student council, I was middle school president. I was high school president, but there were so many challenges I had to go through, especially I felt now looking back as a woman, putting myself out there in positional leaderships at that age, I got bullied a ton. And that opened my eyes, especially when I got to college about 
not only being um, serving in leadership, but serving leaders going through struggles that sometimes they get silenced from as they are public personas. Um, and so that's really fueled me, obviously, now within social media and public spaces that just really keeps me excited to be talking about leadership. Great. Thanks so much, Josie. That is interesting, 4-H. Wow. Um, so Susan, tell us a little bit about how this series came about um, and, and what you hope as a series editor it contributes to the literature. I'll be glad to. I, I probably won't even mesh those together, but um, it was very exciting to me in the 2000s and 2010s. Josie Bass really carved out a niche to be a place to go to for scholarship for student leadership. Uh, I think some of that started in 1998. Nance and Tim and I did the first edition of Exploring Leadership, and believe it or not, that was the first textbook Josie Bass ever did. They were in the business of professional books. So even books like Student Services was designed for a professional audience. It got used in graduate classrooms, but it was designed for professionals to uh, stay up to date. And in this case, uh, the student leadership book was their first test book, which they, they did well with and wanted to continue carving out that area. Uh, so they we partnered with them through the National Clearinghouse on Leadership Programs and did a number of projects with Josie Bass. And then they, of course, expanded and brought in many other leadership things like um, Corey's um, leadership competencies work and other pieces. Um, but in 2014, I was working with our editor there at the time, Erin Null, and said, you know, I, was, I had just retired uh, a year before, and said, we really need a pipeline to continue good scholarship and getting young writers writing and getting editors who have um, talent and a particular expertise tapping um, authors that have good practices. And, and the New Direction series is perfect for that. They weren't initially as interested and then came back about six or eight months later and uh, said, would you be the fat first editor of this? We would like to start this series. And was thrilled to do that. It's talk about generativity. I mean, to be able to be a faculty member for nearly 30 years and then be able to continue working with people on their ideas and their scholarship. And uh, there's so much good work going on out there. We just need to give people avenues to get those things kind of published. So um, we did start the series at that point and asked Kathy to join me in, as the editors of this and launch this series. It was really important for a number of reasons that we tried to get people to look at leadership in a lifespan kind of way. Um, the research that John Dugan and I were doing with MSL or in this, in the, at this time too showed that certainly many things in college contribute to leadership development that we are engaging with as leadership educators, but that the thing that contributes the most to one's leadership capacity is what you did for the 18 years before even coming to college. So the biggest amount of the variance was explained by what you were already, and then we contribute to that, and then things help augment that, and then we can make great progress in that, uh, which really speaks to lifespan and speaks to College educators need to understand the high school experience. Look at all the FFA examples. I mean, you you all brought those experiences in a rich way to, with you to college, but we kind of pretend like nothing ever happened before you became a first year student in our orientation program. So we really need to do better with that. So the the um, the experience we had with MSL with lifespan work, the Kravis Institute did a seeds of leadership kind of approach, um, and I think we all need to think more about lifespan. Interestingly. Josie Bass, the way they made this series be possible was they decided to sunset the New Directions for Youth Development, which had run its course, was very good, but moved us into being then the New Directions for Student Leadership. So our first issue is number 145 because it continues that ISBN number um, and that confuses people, but I thought that example might illustrate. It's kind of nice to be on the shoulders of youth development uh, and taking it where we have since then. Yeah, and I, I like that about this series as well. And I think part of it has to do with that that, that the audience is wider. So it kind of speaks to that lifespan approach. Um, what, what do you think some of the challenges are of including a wider audience, not just college um, leadership educators, but also youth leadership educators? Well, the challenges are huge. And the primary challenge Kathy will nod vigorously at is how do you market to the youth development uh, leadership audience. Most of youth development work in leadership and high, at the high school ages in particular is extracurricular. It's FFA. And it might be sports or it might be student government things, but it's largely outside even the school systems. 
And it's very hard that there's no association of those people. There's no principles for leadership education. I mean, deans of girls and boys doing leadership education. It's really hard to get a hold of that market. So even for authors and what we're doing, that's been challenging. And then the second challenge is um, most of our scholars in higher ed doing leadership research and writing uh, aren't researchers of the K through 12 experience. So they don't know that body of literature very well. I think our authors have been really good about seeking out practical examples examples, models of practice. Uh, lots of the issues have used um, wonderful examples of community-based action, student activism in the high school years, but I think anybody would be uh, informed by what is out there, but it's still hard to find that as a body of work. So if any listeners out there are high school leadership educators and know of ways to reach that market, both for authors as well as for people who would need, want to and read this series, we'd love to hear from you. I have a friend from my high school, actually, who is a leadership educator in Denver. So I will make sure that she knows all about this. I'm writing that down. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Kathy, tell us a little bit about the process of developing an issue um, from start to finish. Yeah, absolutely. It is about an 18 to 24 month process. And so it's one of those things that just doesn't happen overnight, but it takes a lot to evolve into what you see, whether you're seeing it online or in a physical book. But you know, first there has to be a concept, and that concept can be something that we have seen as an issue or that someone will propose to us and saying, this is a gap that we're seeing. As Susan mentioned, we're really looking for that you know, foundational kind of, you know, the new direction, where is student leadership going? And so oftentimes we'll have a concept and then we'll let it sit for a while so it can evolve, right? It's like that marination of kind of where are the different perspectives and the aspects that come in. And then there is a proposal that then Susan and I will um, talk out. We have you know collective kind of conversation about so what what else what else how else can we expand this how else can we include the high school population that we were talking about and then it takes several months to then invite chapter authors and that's the the issue editor of course we will give suggestions but it's the expert of the issue editor and then the issue editor really takes it from there or editors. And they'll work with the chapter authors to create chapters. And typically, there are about eight chapters. That's what we've been seeing in an issue for length. And then there's a lot of editing that goes on between the issue editor and the chapter authors. And then from that, um, from there, it actually is given to us, um, Susan and I, as a series editors, and we'll provide feedback um, and goes through two rounds of that, and then it's a five-month publishing time frame. So it is, it's quite, you know, an extensive process. Sometimes people will say, hey, you know, is this something that we can get out in six months? And it's really much more than that to make sure that we are, you know, expanding across the populations and making sure that we're really thinking um, critically and carefully about the content in there. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to now kind of shift towards talking about the three issues that we're featuring with the three um, issue editors, and this is a point point in the conversation which I'd love you all to engage with each other and ask questions and follow-ups as well, so it's not going to just be me. Um, but I'll start us off with each. Uh, so Josie, tell us a little bit about your issue with Lisa, um, and specifically what trends should we know about regarding digital leadership and how those might affect or impact um, leadership development? Sure. Well, I first need to send a huge Thank you to Kathy and Susan to see this as an important topic um, to be able to put out there. Digital leadership, it's very, uh, you know, choose your own adventure. There isn't established scholarship that has been um, well established, but there is opportunities that we were able to pull in as they challenge to look at a holistic lifespan perspective because we have educators in K-12 that are actually much further along than we are in educating students, maybe in philosophies that might not work at a college environment. Um, so if you look at trends, you'd see digital citizenship being offered to kindergartners. What does it mean to be a good person online um, to then an eighth grader or a 10th grader? Obviously that curriculum would advance. So we sought out two professionals in K-12 that could speak directly to that but then remix it in a way that also could expand to a, a P20 model of digital citizenship. So Lisa and I really wanted to ground the entire um, 
book starting out with what's out there already? How can we even start to bridge the conversation? We can't get to digital leadership until we understand what just the basic trends are and the education that's happening out there already. So we could talk about things like the ACPA NASPA technology competencies, um, ISTE, which is an organization heavily for K-12. Um, what standards do they have for students and uh, administrators? And then we built from there to talk about activism and identity and how we can build virtual teams in a classroom and outside the classroom and what it looks like now to go and find a job and be a professional with all these digital tools as it relates to our identity. And then my chapter pushed a lot about, well, what could um, both formal and informal curriculum look like within teaching these skills about digital leadership? Because the trends we know is that youth are on these tools 13 to 17 year olds, over 93% are on some kind of social media application. Um, 18 to 23, probably about 85%. But at the same time, the definitions of leadership don't work online. It could be that you have a million Twitter followers and you're verified. You could have a heavier influence than a CEO that at their physical lo work location, they have a leadership capacity. So it kind of like opens up all these doors and opportunities to rethink what leadership impact and, and influence could be online, which I think is really exciting. So talk to me a little bit about some of the challenges that maybe um, affect student affairs faculty and staff and how we should be modeling digital leadership as we also teach our students about it. Sure. So I think if we look at the philosophy or approach that I've seen sometimes in K-12 and then also in higher ed is we see negative examples in the news. We'll see a setback, especially if it's a positional leader. For example, a lot of student body presidents, if they make some mistake online, it's definitely going to be in the Chronicle and maybe even on CNN. And so that chips away at our view of can our students handle this? Um, oh, we need policies. We need guidelines. So more than not, I hear students saying, well, I've always been told what not to do, but not that things that I could do with these tools. Over time, we've kind of chipped away um, at their comfortability and feeling like they can put themselves out there because they, they do see other people maybe stumbling on social media, especially in a public way. And then they get messages from parents and educators and supervisors about kind of silencing them. And I especially find positional leaders who are student leaders, basically paraprofessionals, like look at all the requirements we ask RAs to do. And then if we were to ask them, hey, will you market this event? Oh, but then also, hey, would you maybe use this a hashtag to be active in some back channel about a rally we're having on campus or like share your political views. That is so many different directions we're asking them to be in. Um, and my research has found that especially positional leaders um, would prefer not to enter spaces digital spaces where there's any potential for conflict and it's going to come into conflict with their role in their position on campus. So we're asking a lot of them but with very high expectations and very little formal or informal education rather than just policies and guidelines. So we have all these huge opportunities. And also I find to really make an impact with the education I provide, it's not always to layer just the leadership definition to it, but the influence. Because they get digital influencers or people like, you know, Kim Kardashian has millions of Twitter followers or a YouTube uh, channel that has millions of subscribers, what that influence can be starting maybe just from basic blog posts or articles. So I'm trying to inspire them from where they are and not already put these heavy expectations um, and policies. Josie, in your issue, you have a great chapter on digital leadership education pillars. And I know when I read that chapter, I was like, oh, wow, this is this is really critical in our conversation with students. Can you talk a little bit about what that chapter says and how it can be important to our conversation? Sure. So I just want to give a shout out to all the chapter authors. I could just talk about all the chapters endlessly um, and what holistically they offer to this topic, um, especially that don't um, define just within positional leadership. But the research that I have done were on 
I wanted to know what students were experiencing and actually using social media for as an RA or as a Greek life president. So I could just at least have a basis for understanding what could student digital leadership look like? Are there examples? What are they struggling with? And where are opportunities for education? So the pillars come from my dissertation. Um, and it's really the brick and mortar that I built my class at Florida State University with. And I couple it with the social change model because I find if you're really looking to not just build their digital influence, but their leadership efficacy um, and even like self-esteem and confidence, it's great to build in another layer of models that we know already work with college students. And so the pillars, and you can even find these on my website, our topics, their curriculum, there's a, there's a philosophy of what's possible and through a positive lens with social media. So things like building your digital identity. The next one that I'm doing tons of work on is digital wellness. How can we be whole holistic people and try to humanize these tools so we aren't impacted by them from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed because technology is in every single part of our lives. And there's a number of other pieces to the pillars that lead up to digital leadership. We can't start there and ask people, our students to start movements on Twitter if we haven't done the work before that. And what I'm hoping to add to it soon, which I know will come up in this conversation is, now beyond just digital identity, what can be found out about you online, what are the other layers of your identities that are gonna make your digital experience completely different from someone else as based on gender and race and ethnicity that we have to also start to recognize in these pillars and in all of our leadership education work. That is a great segment to talking with Dan about his issue, which was about gender and leadership. Can you, um, Dan, talk us a little bit about how new conceptions of gender inform our leadership development and practice. Sure. Well, I just want to start off and say I wouldn't be here and this issue wouldn't happen without the good work and collaboration that I was able to do with Dr. Paige Haber-Curran at Texas State University. Um, and so hi, Paige, if you're watching. Um, so uh, I think as leadership educators, both Paige and I, one of our biggest frustrations as folks who are interested at looking at gender and also leadership and then the connections and intersections between those two is that so much of the research and scholarship that currently exists out there um, inadequately talks about the connections between gender and leadership. And what I, what I mean by that is so much of it actually frames the discussion around this gender binary of men and women and oftentimes sort of pitting them against. So looking at the differences between men and women in their leadership practices, but that often, um, sort of erases or renders invisible other individuals who may identify outside of that gen rigid gender binary. And so that's problematic to us. So we wanna sort of expand on that discourse and understand what are trans, uh, what's trans leadership look like? What is gender nonconforming? What about students who are agender and practicing leadership and, and talking about that? The other piece too is that so much of the literature, when there's a section or you open up a, a textbook on gender and leadership, it's actually coded language for women and leadership. There's very often a lack of discussion about um, other gender identities and expressions and how that contributes to one's leadership practice. So for us, we really wanted to sort of use intersectionality as a lens because we just see the connection between sort of other social identities in connection with gender, um, but also sort of the systemic pieces of power, privilege, uh, oppression, but also then the connections of that to power and authority and leadership itself. So for us, we, we see that connection and we wanted to sort of move in that direction. So, you know, again, ultimately, I think when we think about um, student leadership and gender, I think we really want to push the conversation to look past the traditional notions of leadership that are really rooted in white patriarchal ideas um, and want to move more towards process orientation, flattened hierarchy, um, sort of activist-based grassroots movements that actually take that up. So I think 
just thinking about it from a practical sort of way, when we see student protests on campus around Black Lives Matter, or when we see, um, you know, all of the sort of movement around, um, you know, the current political climate and what that looks like on campus, then using that and, and seeing that as leadership, because it's emergent and it's about creating positive social change within one's communities. And I think sometimes, again, the focus becomes so wrapped up in positional leadership at times for some leadership educators. And so trying to move, move past that. Um, additionally, how could we sort of expand spaces for gender, um, gender-based work that's actually uh, within group, but then also across group. And so we, we think that there's a both and here. And I know Heather in your chapter, because Heather was a contributing author along with Chris Wren on um, one of the chapters, and they make that argument. And I think it's a really important one. And I know you're gonna talk a little bit hopefully about that, but those are sort of the things that I think are important when we are sort of grappling with these intersections in this work. Susan, do you want to um, kind of ask a little bit about some of the challenges? And I know you have some other specific questions around critical perspectives on gender. Yeah, um, Dan, I, I wondered, um, what are the challenges in trying to work with um, traditional cis students who see things as the binary in understanding the importance or finding themselves in this different approach? And maybe that gets at liberation pedagogy and other strategies you talk about in the book, but um, what do you find what do you find works to move those students to a broader view? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, especially when we look across um, gender identity, you know, I think there often is a, co a much broader conversation around women and, and leadership that's happened over time um, within um, different spaces on college campuses. Um, but even when we think about masculinity and working with college men specifically, I know um, Cameron Beatty and I worked on a chapter around college men, and we did talk about using sort of liberatory pedagogy, so sort of Frary's work and other critical approaches to helping men sort of make meaning of masculinity. Because oftentimes men, college men have never been asked largely how you make sense of your masculinity or your gender. Um, and, and through the research, we know that that's often uh, a piece that's not a part of their lived experience or thought process because it's wrapped up in privilege. So that's, that's a very different question and mindset. And so creating spaces where we actually merge gender work with leadership work and run it parallel, I think is really important as a practical sort of tool set, because if we're doing that, and then we can sort of move from that conversation about the meaning making of gender and one's own sort of um, gender identity to then how does that play out for your leadership practice? And then from there talking about how do you enact power and authority and and how do you understand process and the relationship that happens within leadership context? I think those are critical questions that then suddenly just create a snowball effect of of critical self-reflection in ways that are really powerful and transformative for students. So the more that we can do that within group, you know, so having conversations with gender non-conforming trans students around sort of um, what this means, what their gender identity means for them, how does then that play into leadership practice? Um, and doing that, again, in, in group, but then also across group, I think can really create some transformative opportunities within the college environment. Heather, before we move on from this um, issue, would you mind talking about your chapter? You, you know, talked about feminist leadership, and I think you're not only the host, but you're this incredible scholar, and I would love to hear your thoughts on, you know, the use of that term, feminist leadership, and how we as leadership educators can really use that. Yeah, thanks so much, Kathy. Um, so Chris Wren and I co-authored the last chapter in this volume about taking action. And we talked about the potential for using a feminist leadership framework, um, which is a connective framework using feminist thought um, and strategies for transforming organizations and systems. Um, and that we made clear in our chapter that we're not just talking about feminist leadership um, being accessible to only women identified individuals. Um, so we spend time in our chapter really specifically talking about action items. So looking for strategies to reshape organizations, finding both coalitional and separate spaces, um, combating activism fatigue, and then also increasing capacity. Uh, it was, it was a, a great honor to be able to co-author that with Chris and uh, work with uh, Paige and Dan. So thanks for, thanks for that. 
Um, okay, moving on. Uh, Corey, I am also now curious about your issue. So you talk about leadership competencies in working with students. What, what should we know about that? Well, thanks, uh, thanks Heather for asking. And, and I just want to do a shout out, another great one to um, Susan and Kathy for having the trust to be able to explore this issue even deeper. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I'm thrilled with the chapters that are coming together. We're, our, our issue is right now in editing. We're sort of at the tail end. So it's exciting to see everything come together. But to give you a little bit of frame of reference about competencies, uh, leadership competencies are, are used in, in organizations outside of higher ed. Uh, on a grand scale. I mean, they're used in businesses and nonprofits and associations have all sorts of competencies that they expect their professionals to aspire to or seek to um, be proficient in. Yet, um, back in uh, 2008, I was doing some research on how do we take this and translate it back to the college student environment? How are we training and helping develop our students to develop the capacities and the competencies that they need to be successful when they're asked to do the same very thing out in their organizations? And so um, I worked on a map out uh, 522 accrediting organizations and figure out what the competencies were that co crossed over those and we came up with 60 competencies. So I've been um, really interested in this competency work for quite a while now. Um, but what was exciting about this issue is taking my interest in expanding it to um, the inclusion of other authors that wanted to explore pieces of competencies in a college student leadership environment. Um, and what's really neat about the competencies is although uh, the, the work that this was derived from was based on colleges, um, I found that a lot of people are using it in high schools. And so one of the neat things about our issue is that it can be very easily translated to both high school and college um, level for student leadership development. And so the idea is, is that competencies are uh, the knowledge, the value, the ability and behavior that you need to be able to successfully engage in a role or a task. So um, what's, what's alluring about competencies is that they're, they're very well defined and they're also measurable. And um, this whole thing spawned from the idea that I was working as a director of leadership programs on, on a, camp, a campus prior to the job I was doing, and we could not figure out what in the world we wanted our students to learn, and then how we were even going to measure whether they were learning it. And so what, what this issue does is it takes readers from start to finish, everything from what our competencies how can we leverage them and use them in student leadership development, whether that's high school or college students, whether that's inside or outside of the classroom, whether that's positional or non-positional, and then all the way through the end to how do you assess, and even a chapter that I'm thrilled about is the introduction of a chapter on gamification, the ability to take game elements and be able to weave them in using competencies to help students kind of gamify their leadership experience in a measurable way. And so this issue is exciting in the fact that um, a reader can literally pick it up and go through from start to finish and know how to design a program or a course or an experience um, and, and then be able to design it facilitate it and measure it all all within one issue. So that's what's really exciting to me about this particular issue. So tell me a little bit about some of the challenges of using competencies-based frameworks, specifically around culture and identity and different contexts. Sure, absolutely. Well, you know, just like anything, there's um, there are critiques and there are assets. So it's, it's interesting because uh, in using competencies, uh, some scholars have said it's, it's too, um, too refined, too regimented. There's this list, it's simplified, it takes leadership and takes the complexity out of it by saying, here are the 10 things you need to be able to do. Um, whereas other scholars say that there aren't quite enough competencies. So, so on the one hand, you've got people saying, you know, 10 isn't enough, other people saying 10 is too many, and other people saying that you can't, you can't, you know, take leadership and, and decomplexify it. Um, and then there's other people who say that it's focused on leader development versus leadership development per se. So, so there's certainly some critiques around it. Um, the assets, though, far outweigh them in the fact that they are they can be used for, uh, you know, intentional learning outcome design uh, for measurements. There's various measurements that you can do, including self assessments and 360s. So they they bring a lot to the table um, to be able to figure out what students are learning and developing. I, I will preface it with one other thing is a lot of the misnomers around competencies, it comes with this idea of mastery, that we somehow master something and we are an expert in it because we have, quote, achieved a competency. When in reality, in the college student environment and the high school student environment, we're really looking at uh, proficiency. Are students developing more of a proficiency than they had previous to their experience? Is our learning intervention helping them move 
on a continuum of learning. And that's a critical piece about what makes this type of competency work in an educational setting different than maybe something that would appear on an evaluation for a job. Um, so, so those are some of the critiques. What's interesting, though, is to keep in mind with anything you're looking at in terms of leadership, but specifically with competencies, is the idea of context. Context matters. So there might be a particular competency that you want to use in one context, but you might not want to use in another. Um, and, and it can be a valuable competency, it's just your, your context matters. Your role and your power authority matters. So if you, you know, are somehow you're facilitating a meeting where you want to get feedback and you enact verbal communication and you're talking the whole time, that isn't very useful for that particular situation. So you need to be able to navigate and assess the situation to be able to pull that competency out of your toolbox to use it when it's most applicable in that situation. And, and that aligns also with this idea of culture and our own identities is uh, if you look at studies like the Globe study, you can look at different, uh, leadership is seen in different ways around the world. Something around power might be seen in one culture as very different than another. And so we, we wanna keep in mind that, that certain competencies have certain, certain cultural, uh, I guess, tags with them, right? This idea that in these particular settings um, that we need to be aware of that they're not always all that useful. Um, and, and in some cases, maybe counterproductive to what we're doing. So uh, I think it's really important as we think of competencies to think of them, I always frame it as, it's a toolbox. It's a toolbox, pull out what you need, develop, develop those particular areas, pull out what you need when the context and the, and the situation is, is applicable. Um, and so, that, so those are just some of my thoughts on, on using leadership competencies. Thanks, Corey. Corey, one of the challenges um, in leader, you know, one of the assets that competencies bring us is uh, some of the measurement tools and some of the um, direct ways to measure, at least through student self-perception, those competencies. But what happens in baseline process when you're working with initial students and they over, they think I'm a wonderful anything, you know, fill in the blank. I'm great at listening, but all they do is talk or I'm a wonderful leader. Uh, but all they do is boss people around me. How do you get the reality to jive with what the real competency is trying to accomplish? Yeah, that is a great question. It's funny because uh, when people will take the, they'll take like a, I have a competency inventory that for the student leadership competencies, and they'll take it twice, and their their scores will go down. Um, and that's because they realize they overinflated their abilities at the beginning. Um, I would say some of the strategies to use are things like rubrics, 360 feedback. Um, I do use an, uh, a particular assignment in one of my classes where I will have them take the assessment, they'll self-assess, and then they have to actually show those results to two people in, in a particular context in their life, and they have to validate whether or not they think that those are really their findings, or you know, is that true about them? And they write a reflection paper about that. Um, so I guess any of these things come with a grain of salt. It's just like any kind of a self-assessment is being very careful that um, that we don't just say here's a quick here's a self assessment this is who you are and then leave it um, just like any other element of competencies it needs to be intentionally interwoven into a curricular format how are we developing the students how are we assessing them and then how are we following up with them to continue their development so I, I think that's critical um, one other piece that I wanted to mention too is that I that I didn't before was one of the advantages of, of looking at leadership competencies is it also provides a common language across the institution. And what's been really nice is I've worked with some institutions who um, have implemented the competencies um, in student affairs and then worked with academic departments to use the same language to, um, I, to identify their experiences. And so they can collectively um, be on the same page uh, in terms of their curriculum and their content. But from an assessment standpoint, if everybody's using the same language to talk about leadership, it makes it a whole lot easier to create uh, a unifying message and a unifying force of what leadership is on our campus. So I want to move towards some questions that we crowdsourced um, via Facebook and Twitter, uh, which I thought would be great to pose to you all as experts in the, and scholars in the field. Um, and so I'm going to hopefully get to a couple of these. We'll see. Uh, we're kind of getting short on time. Stephanie Chang asked the question, how can leadership educators be more identity conscious in their approach to leadership education? Um, Kathy, do you want to start? I will. Oh, good question, Stephanie. Good question. Um, it, the first um, issue that comes to mind for me is the culturally relevant leadership learning issue. That was 152. 
that actually I co-edited that issue, but I think that really speaks to how are we more culturally relevant in creating environments for you know, individuals to really bring their identity and their diverse voices into an environment to really learn le leadership and to have those opportunities. And so that would be one of the issues, because um, with any of this, as leadership educators, we have to think about our own identity first and do the tough work first before we can really you know, be the best leadership educator that we can be. The second issue um, that's actually just in the beginning stages is John Dugan is going to be expanding his work on critical perspectives. And that's not coming out until later of next year, 2018. But then, of course, Dan, would you want to talk about your um, work with the issue that's about ready to be published actually in just a few weeks? I yeah. That's I think we're around 20 days, give or take. <laughs> Um, so that's exciting. Um, yeah, so I think for us, one of the things that Paige and I were really trying to put forward is in order to do this critical work, you have to do a lot of unlearning, right? And so spending time as leadership educators, um, particularly around this idea of, of in our issue, gender, um, unlearning the ways in which gender socialization, gender role expectations have been so deeply ingrained in all of us and the ways in which we don't know other parts of genders that are outside, outside of our own sort of realm or small bubble, like then sometimes we gravitate to, um, well, we need to understand terminology and we need to understand all of these like nuance pieces. Well, yes, that's important, but we also have to then unpack what does that mean for us? We can't depend on um, individuals of those gender identities to be the ones who are educating us. We have to do that work ourselves. And again, so how can we create systems for ourselves in which we're doing the work, we're unlearning, we're, we're then um, attempt, making attempts to create and, and move forward in our knowledge base. Uh, we make mistakes, we move, we learn from them, we move forward, right? So um, there's a great chapter that Michael, um, uh, Michael and Aaron Lovett Collier, who are um, married couple, but run um, two different retreats at the University of San Diego, contribute to this issue, talking about sort of the self work that they have done through the work of facilitating these gender-based leadership retreats on their campus. And I think that's a great contribution in terms of just a starting point to ask some critical questions of um, oneself as a leadership educator and how can we start to do this work in really important ways that are gonna be meaningful for our students. So one other question from our crowdsource um, group. Um, Robin Janice asked the question about how leadership and training often get conflated. Uh, Susan, maybe you can begin talking about how those things are different and, and we, how should we should di distinguish between both of them. Uh, I'd be glad to. And I think um, if people don't know it, I would encourage you to look at the CAST standards for student leadership programs. They are framed around the concept that came out of the Interassociational Leadership Task Force back in the 70s and 80s, uh, which has often been called the TED model, training, education, and development. And that's used widely even outside of our field in, in higher education. But the idea that uh, there are uh, approaches and strategies around training, around education, and around development. So training is often specific capacity building for a role that you have like the treasurer in the organization or a particular a task you have to accomplish like agenda planning or agenda setting. Uh, education becomes the study of leadership, leadership studies, learning about something, the knowledge acquisition largely, and then development becomes the scaffolding to go from being more simple in your approaches to more complex and developing increased capacity uh, uh, through knowledge as well as experience, etc. Um, I think it's really good to think of um, building good foundational training capacities, and this gets at competencies too, I think, in Corey's work, but to build some good competencies that one might train for that become a foundational base for efficacy building for actually complex development. One quick example, um, I used to poo-poo that things like agenda planning were not really leadership development. That was just training, you know, to teach people how to develop agendas was like really low level. And then it became really aware to me in the leadership identity development work that if we didn't teach people how you could build an agenda to be inclusive and empowering, engaging of all members, uh, creating 
being an open space for ideas, being culturally relevant, aware of context, then uh, the person who isn't aware of that leads very poorly in a group, and those that are aware of that have a very dynamic functioning group. So agenda planning skills become an asset for someone trying to develop more complexity in their leadership development. But I think the TED model works still for us in that regard. So one other follow-up question related to that is that um, when we often talk about leadership, we talk about it in kind of a decentralized way, but that has some kinds of challenges in terms of bringing all the people who are doing leadership work together around the table. Um, and they're not necessarily speaking the same language. It, Corey, can you talk a little bit about how you've worked with those types of systems and maybe some, um, if there are inherent challenges or inherent benefits? Sure, absolutely. Well, you know, and having come from a very large campus, this decentralized leadership was really prominent. Sometimes we didn't even know what was happening. We'd get a flyer about a program and thought, well, that's interesting. Didn't even know that was going on. Um, I will say a couple things about decentralization is, is one, um, is it isn't necessarily inherently a bad thing. Um, I know there's some kind of a sense that we need to control what leadership looks like on our campus, but um, this decentralization provides an opportunity for that nuanced contextual leadership that I talked about earlier, whereas maybe a leadership program in the engineering department might need to look very different than one over in liberal arts or one that's a student affairs program or an RA retreat because the context in which they're leading might be different. With that said, um, there are some commonalities that cut across all of these. So looking at what are the leadership philosophies? Do we view leadership as a role? or position or do we see it as a process? Um, what are some of the values that we have? Do we all believe that ethics is important for leaders? Um, so, so being able to come together and have a commonality in the way that we see leadership can be very useful in the sense that um, it puts forth kind of this institutional message of how we want to put leaders out in our communities, especially since leadership is interwoven into a number of institutional mission statements. But the practice of it and the development of it doesn't have to be completely, um, you know, you know, collected into one box of what we're doing. But with that said, I think there is a value in being able to identify what's happening on a campus and periodically pull people together to share ideas, resources, make sure you're not programming on each other's dates, um, you know, just some of those more tactical pieces, and also trying to target different populations of students. Because the idea is to spread leadership further, not narrow it down and have the same 25 people in six different programs on campus. So there is a value in being able to say, let's come together periodically. It could be a think tank. It could just be at a listserv or just a common website to say, what is it that we're all doing? What do we all believe? Um, and then support each other in the efforts that we're doing across campus. Awesome. Thanks so much, Corey. Um, so I think we're getting kind of towards the end of our time, but I want to spend just a few minutes talking about um, upcoming topics in the series because we've alluded to a few of them, but um, we can maybe tweet out a list or show a list. Um, so Su Susan, tell us a little bit about what's in the pipeline. Yes, I'd love to do that. And like Kathy says, we do have to plan a couple years out. So some of these you won't see till 2018 or 2019. Uh, but we, one of the next ones right after Corey's issue will be on student organizations and their role in developing leadership, uh, career readiness in leadership, mentoring, coaching, and advising, critical perspectives in leadership development by John Dugan, um, leadership learning through activism. Uh, then we have some issues coming out in 2019 on global leadership and one on leadership development through student employment. Uh, so I, I think we've got some really nice forthcoming issues. Awesome. I love it. Um, Kathy, so if somebody who is watching today has an idea for a proposal, um, what should they do? You know, it's as simple as just emailing Susan and I and starting with a conversation because sometimes people will not know that, oh, we have this issue coming up or, you know, that there's something in the works. And so thinking about that the topic has to be broad enough and it can't really focus on certain populations and it has to be transferable across high school and college. But it's simply just sending us an email and saying, this is what I have. And then we'll discuss further, you know, concept development and proposal development. Awesome. Very cool. So I want to spend some time at the end just kind of wrapping up any thoughts that you all have that you didn't get a chance to share um, during our short hour together today. And also, if you could leave our viewers with one takeaway that you want them to kind of think about or maybe talk about further um, after we conclude, um, that would be awesome. And if there are resources that you'd like to share, books, articles, blogs, uh, YouTubes, uh, we can tweet out those as well. So Josie, we're gonna we're gonna start with you. Awesome. So one challenge that I would leave for you is 
to see where you can create space for the most simple and basic conversations to hear what the real lived experiences of both positional and non-positional students within a digital context are. There's so many assumptions that we have of why youth are drawn to Snapchat versus Yik Yak, which is now RIP. Um, but it's so important for us to actually know what those real experiences are if we're wanting to then program to them. And I build in time into all of my courses and the sessions and keynotes that I offer because I need to stay relevant in what they're really living and feeling. And I find out much more of experiences they had in seventh grade on Facebook still impact how they look at Facebook today. And so that humanistic life cycle perspective of even social media and the leadership potential in a digital space um, come from middle school and high school, just like our leadership experiences where we first started to get involved. So have one-on-one -on -one conversations, have focus groups, uh, ask students lots of questions to flip the model of let them educate you if you're looking to then provide what I aim to offer in digital leadership education, because I think there's a lot of misperceptions we have that are missing potential real um, opportunities to connect with students so they can really hear us. A couple of resources is I mentioned the ISTE standards, I-S-T-E, to just give you an idea of at least with our K-12 colleagues, some standards they they have and then get to know digital citizenship curriculum because the more i ask students did you ever have this curriculum anytime in k-12 they're saying more and more they have so they've actually been taught some of this stuff we could start to scaffold more advanced curriculum like leadership um, like influence um, and even within identity populations to push the envelope a little bit further and then just selfishly the other um, resource to think about is i started a podcast in the fall called Called Josie and the podcast. It's not about me. It's about guests where we talk about what does leadership look like aligned with technology. Um, and hopefully you'll laugh too and learn. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, just to go back to the whole um, education piece, in school districts that are now having one-to-one -one devices, I think this is becoming much more prominent in terms of sharing um, with students uh, and talking about standards of my 12-year-old is getting that right now. Um, Dan, tell us a little bit about your takeaways, uh, challenges for folks, resources to share, et cetera. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, number one, I, I really am so proud of all of the um, chapters that are in this forthcoming issue um, and the good thinking of my terrific esteemed colleagues who have contributed work. Um, in particular, I, I want to point to one chapter out of that issue that I think is particularly important for folks to keep thinking about, and that's the contribution of trans leadership chapter that TJ Jorian and S. Simmons wrote. I, again, when we look at what we know out there around trans and gender nonconforming folks and leadership, it is so um, under-researched and under-resourced as an area, and I think that that's like, the if you don't take if you don't read anything that i wrote read theirs because that is like incredible and and i just think that they did such great work in that area um the other piece that i'll just mention is the great benefit of this series is that if you work at an institution that has the wiley um, database you can download all of these articles and issues for free um, and i encourage you to go do that because these are such a tremendous resource so again that's sort of like my takeaway of like go go download all of these things all these conversations, I'm like going to rush and download all of the um, folks here and the ones that are forthcoming. Um, and I know I use them often. So I just encourage you to check those out. Thanks so much, Dan. Corey. I would say just a couple things is, is when I think about uh, what our what our issue contributes is this idea of being very intentional about what it is that we want students to learn and develop as they go into leadership roles, leadership opportunities and experiences. 
Um, and, and I think that's the contribution of the, of the issue with the wonderful authors that I got to work with. One of the other things that I will say just in general about uh, New Directions is, is I love the applied nature of it. I always refer to myself as a pracademic because it's taking the academic and making it practical. And, and I know I'm not the only one who can say that. This is just really what inherently what this series offers. It takes things that are you know tried and true and, and, and you know, good research and brings it to a point in which you can actually do something with it. There's action plans and steps and it's the easy reading and that's what I love about it and so as I mentioned before with our particular issue is you can start from the very beginning to the very end sit down with a cup of tea and read yourself a nice little novel on leadership competencies because you're going to be able to leave at the very end with a strategic plan on how you want to influence your own programs and courses and opportunities just simply by reading through um, this particular issue. And I know my colleagues, we can say the same of theirs as well. They're just very practical and very, very useful and easy to um, be able to take concepts and implement them. As far as a resource, if you want to learn more about the student leadership competencies in particular, you can go to www.studentleadershipcompetencies.com and you can find a lot of great free resources on there to implement um, on your campuses. Thanks so much, Corey. Kathy, your takeaways, resources, final thoughts? Yeah, I really have to echo um, what Corey was saying about the practical nature of this, because I identify with that as well, about how, you know, it's great to have research and theory, but then the so what piece, how are we actually using it to really move forward leadership education? And I really believe in leadership for all. And so we have so many students, high school, college students that just don't believe that they have the capacity or the efficacy to be leaders. And so how do we get that conversation shifted? And I think that there's multiple ways of doing this through this practical series. And so giving space and place for people to really talk about identity and bring their, their selves, all of them, and their best version of themselves, I think is great in different ways that this series offers. Thanks, Kathy. Susan, final thoughts from you. Oh no, you're on mute. I was going to be good about that. <laughs> I think we, I think we in our leadership educator and student affairs kind of roles do really well with individual development. We're all doing a good job expanding students' capacity uh, to see how they can be more effective working with others. I would really challenge us to look at the group context, the organizational context. We need to be more intentionally teaching how leadership processes work when people are together and how everybody there is responsible for that process. And so student organizations be become more critical to that, group, group assignments in classes, teamwork kinds of opportunities. So let's do better with groups and students when they are in groups together. It's kind of like if you've ever been in a bad department meeting, you know everybody individually is great, but they can't function together or make a decision. You know, so we need to work at that level of advancing what good things could look like. And then we would like to encourage all of you, this is the shameless plug, uh, subscribe to the series for your office. So subscribe to it yourself and share it with the office. But as Dan said, they're all available to you free if your university subscribes to Wiley Online. So go download lots of PDFs. The series is young enough, you could begin establishing a library with all of them. Yes, and we're going to send out a link to all of the published episodes or published editions as well as the future editions um, for folks as well. So uh, to the five of you, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to spend time with you today talking about New Directions for Student Leadership. It's been awesome. Um, I've learned a lot. There's some, definitely some pieces that I'll take and, and think a little bit more about. Uh, also, thanks to our program sponsors, ACPA and M. Stoner. Um, just a preview, coming up in two weeks on Student Affairs Live, Tony will be back with Dr. Scott Becker talking about mental health and technology um, on his next episode. And you can receive reminders about this and all of the other episodes by subscribing to the Higher Ed Live newsletter. You can browse our archives at higheredlive.com. You can even download our iTunes podcast. Again, I'm Heather Shea. Thanks again to all of our fam fabulous panelists. Thanks for everybody who was watching live today. Uh, make it a great week, everyone.